Casey Taylor, and this is FCC TV, where we feature the Fitchburg Cultural Council funded programs and the organizations behind them. Today, I have Zach Boss from Bonfire Press with us, and we have Davis Bates of A Celtic Celebration Songs and Stories for the Season. How are you today, Davis Bates? I'm great, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. It's so good to see you. You too. You too. So we had talked uh, earlier in the summer about a different program. Do you remember which one that was? Oh, that the one I did, Sea Songs and Stories. Yes, absolutely, yeah. and how did that one go? It was fun. Excellent, it was fun. excellent, beautiful. So today we're going to talk about a Celtic celebration. Yes. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right in. What could you tell us about the background of your work, but also the Celtic Celebration program itself? Well, that program comes from, I, I, it goes with St. Patrick's Day for one, um, but I'm not Irish. So um, I didn't want to do an Irish program, but I am Scottish. So I figured I could do a program of Scottish, Irish, and Welsh songs and stories. Um, I actually usually start the program by saying uh, I was actually due on St. Patrick's Day, but I was late, and it wasn't the last time I was ever late. <laughs> so I wasn't actually born until April 4th. Um, so I was going to be born on St. Patrick's Day, which gives me another connection to it. And then I go on and do songs and stories. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, how long have you been doing this specific show? This show, I've been doing pieces of this show for a really long time. Like um, one of the songs I sing was a song my dad sang to me at bedtime. Uh, so I actually sang it when I was a kid. But the program itself, probably about three, four years now. Wow, incredible. Um, and what sort of community benefits have you seen as a result of the stories you tell and the pieces that you perform? Well, one fun thing is uh, when I first started, I would um, I would tell stories and sing a few songs. Like maybe in an hour long program, there would be 45 minutes of stories and 15 minutes of songs. And now it's getting to be more songs than stories. And part of the reason is I really enjoy people singing along. And that's something people don't do as much as they used to. There's something about group singing, being in a group of people. Sometimes you don't know everybody, but everybody knows the song, so you sing along, and all of a sudden you're connected in a very profound way that folks don't get to experience as much anymore. Beautiful. Yeah. That's, and I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I and do. That, that's really fun. And the other thing that happens too is that people will come up to me and they'll share their story with me. Like, I don't do it in this program, but um, this wedding ring was my grandfather's wedding ring. Mm -hmm. And I often tell a story about him and how I came to wear the ring. And I've had people come up to me and show me their ring and then tell me the story behind that and who it came from. And, and that's really fun. To hear other people's stories is great. It is, and it's so special. It really creates a good connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, what are some challenges that you've come across with this type of work in the past, and how have you been addressing them? Oh, challenges. Well, the, I have had a, a challenge where I went to a place where they were used to um, Frank Sinatra style programs, okay. which I am not anywhere near <laughs> Frank Sinatra. I like Frank Sinatra, but I'm, I just don't do the same kind of thing. And I once went to a place where uh, it was a long room and I was in the middle and there was this narrow part here, big part here, big part here. The folks over here really liked the program and the folks over there really didn't like the program. And it wasn't that they were being rude, but that they were just staring at me mm -hmm. like, why are we here kind of thing. But everybody over here was having a really great time. And it was really hard not to just look at these people. Yes. And, but the, my job is to look at everybody. And I hope, I mean, that some people over here were still getting something good out of it. And if I didn't look at them, they were going to get less good out of it than if I did. So that's one challenge. But that hasn't happened very much. The other challenge I have is sometimes and that doesn't happen very much either, is going into a song and suddenly forgetting a verse. Yes. I can definitely empathize with forgetting lines. Yes. <laughs> so then I just start over again. And, and usually the verse comes, you know. 
Excellent, that's amazing. Uh, what steps have you taken to make sure that this program is both accessible and inclusive to the communities that you deliver it to? Well, partly that's the publicity mm -hmm. that I send out to people. Um, the other part of the senior center is has a ramp in the back. Um, and just reaching out to as many people in the community as possible through the PR. Absolutely. So it's handicap accessible and then getting the word out to all sorts of folks. So important. Yeah. Very important. Uh, and how can community members take advantage of the very specific show that you are doing on the 9th of March? Yeah, the 9th of March, um, I think it's at 1030 in the morning. Uh, basically get in touch with the Senior Center. Uh, I don't think reservations are required. It's free. Um, so if they have any questions about how to get there, um, get in touch with the Senior Center, get directions, and just arrive like 15 minutes ahead of time. Excellent. Now, I see that you have a briefcase of sorts with you and yes. another object or three next to you on this table. This was my grandfather's briefcase. Uh, I not wow. only have his wedding ring, I have his briefcase. Does he know which you he have gave all these things me. from him? And he <laughs> was an accountant, so he carried papers in it, very important papers. I carry my microphone um, and a bunch of spoons, which I play music with. Uh, a friend of mine taught me how to play music with spoons. These are really cool. I've been to a school in Long Island for 22 years. And I do an assembly for the first grader, and, and then I go into the classroom. And they really liked the spoons that I play. And last year was my 20th anniversary, and they sent me a pair of spoons. That's so good. That, um, and the other thing about them is they have printed on them, you are awesome. Oh, wow. And as I tell folks when I show them, uh, you can make somebody's day just by telling them they're awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they made my week. So th the way I play spoons, And uh, there's a song that I sing. It, um, I won't do the whole song because we don't have time. But uh, the chorus of the song I'll, I'll do for you. All right. And uh, if you're in an Irish band, this is an Irish song. If you're in a Scottish band, it's a Scottish song. So you can say whatever it is if you want to, whichever one you are. Okay. And if you're neither, then you can just make it up. But the chorus goes like this. Mary Mac's mother making Mary Mac marry me, and my mother's making me Mary Mary Mac. I'll have to marry Mary to get married to take care of me. We'll all be making Mary when I marry Mary Mac. <laughs> and that's the chorus. Love it. And I, I teach the song by doing a call and response really slow, and um, then gradually speed up. And you'd be amazed how many people actually sing. And I say, if you get your tongue twisted, because it is a tongue twister, you can just go ma 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 ma. And you'll be right a good percentage of the time. <laughs> um, this is a, a friend of mine. Um, he's sleeping. You can tell he's on his back. Uh, a lot of dogs sleep on their back. Yes. A lot of kids ask me if he's a real dog. And he, I tell them, yes, he is a real dog. He's a real wooden dog. He is a real wooden yeah, dog. Yeah, he's a real wooden dog. Yes. They're cheaper. It definitely. No vet bills. Um, they do sleep a lot, though. Uh, but. Uh, if you could help me wake him up. Okay. Okay. Uh, some people like to be woken up by alarm clocks, loud noises. He doesn't. He likes being woken up by whispering. Okay. And his name is Bingo. Bingo. So on the count of three, we'll just go, Bingo, please wake up. See if I do okay. it by myself, it doesn't work. Okay, okay. here we go. One, two, three. Bingo, Bingo please, please wake, wake up. up. <laughs> See, it worked. Cool. <laughs> now that he's awake. You are awake, aren't you? Yeah, okay. Um, we'll get him to dance. Bingo, you gotta get on the board to dance. He's a traditional, besides being a real dog, he's a traditional um, Scottish American, Irish American instrument called a limberjack. Uh, and when he bounces on the board, his feet do percussion. And his favorite song, which you probably guess, his name is Bingo. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Yes. There was a farmer had a dog, and Bingo <laughs> was his name. Oh, B. He's a fancy dancer. Oh, B. I love I it. N -G -O, B I N G O B I N G O B I N G O Bingo was his name. Oh. <laughs> yeah. He likes to take a bow, and then he usually falls back asleep. Excellent.
Yep. Oh, so beautiful. He'll, he'll take a nap, if that's okay. That's okay, that's okay. Uh, before we started, uh, you told me some very interesting historical facts about the Limberjack. Would oh, you mind repeating yeah. that? And I didn't know this until I was putting together this program, and I thought, oh, I'm gonna use a Limberjack. I don't know where it came from. So the wonders of internet, you can do research. And I found that um, this little doll originally came from what was called a jack doll. And buskers in London or in Dublin would play the fiddle and they'd have actually a marionette with strings coming up from all the limbs up to a pulley that went back to another pulley and then the strings went down to a pedal that when the fiddle player would play and tap their foot on the pedal, the strings would make the doll move and make it look like it was dancing a jig, Brilliant. which is why it was called a jig doll. And then they started taking, um, originally, they'd be little people, uh, a person, a torso with the legs and the arms and the board, they would bounce and dance. And in this country, they started making them in the shape of animals. Because kids like animals. Kids do like animals. And also, when they have four legs, they more make noise. more noise, <laughs> and kids like more noise. <laughs> so that's where the lumberjack came from. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for meeting with us today. It was oh, great to you. see you again. Davis Bates, everyone. Uh, it's March 9th at 10 a.m., I believe. 10.30 a.m. 10.30 a.m. At the Fishburg Senior Center. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Fitchburg Cultural Council has awarded more than 53,000 in grants in 2022, supporting 52 local arts and culture projects, including performances, public art installations, and programs designed to improve the quality of life here in North Central Massachusetts. The funded pro projects include a collaboration between local schools and theater groups to educate students about the city's role, for example, in the abolition of slavery, as well as a summer concert series at Cogsall Park and the Upper Common, public art installations, and many, many more things in the creative economy. Your cultural council is committed to supporting a vibrant community of artists, and we will continue to spread the news about all the wonderful things happening in our city here as a growing cultural destination. So follow us on social media and tune in to FCC TV every month to learn more about what your cultural council is doing. Right. We're here today with Zach Boss of Bonfire Press and the Bonfire Bookshop, is That's that correct. correct? Yes. Excellent. So Zach, what can you tell us about the origin story of Bonfire Press and the Abolitionist Voices Community Publishing Workshop? Um, well, I moved to Fitchburg just a couple of years ago and I love going to a bookshop. Notice we didn't have one. Uh, my ambition to open up a bricks and mortar location here uh, began, uh, many people probably remember it, watching me sitting in strong style coffee with boxes of old books, pricing them and evaluating them and learning more about that trade. Uh, I'm actually hoping to open our location uh, in the Dickinson building next to strong style later this year with a launch event aiming for midsummer so we can have a midsummer bonfire. Wow. Um, but I didn't get my start in book selling. In fact, I just left Boston University after 18 years, where for more than 15 years I was the coordinator of a book lab. I would work with students, faculty, and alumni to hear their project ideas and help them realize them in some publication format. So now that I'm opening Bonfire Bookshop, I wanted to bring some of that book lab experience here to the community. And that's the origin of Bonfire Press, which is our, our community projects uh, project. Nice, nice, excellent. And what can you tell us about the Abolitionist Voices Workshop? That's, that's our first program through Bonfire Press. Um, when I first moved here, I first heard about the local activism scene because of David Tibolt Munoz and his team of student historians at Mount Wachusett Community College. 
Uh, folks were telling me, you got to go down to these city council meetings. You have to support them. I learned about what they were doing. They had dug up and surfaced some of the, the heritage and lore of abolitionism here in Fitchburg within the city limits. You know, it wasn't just something theoretical for people. When W.E.B. Du Bois was on a speaking tour, he would skip a bunch of the local communities. He'd come to Fitchburg. He'd stay in the home of Benjamin Snow. Uh, he would go stand on stage in downtown Fitchburg because the people here were ready to hear it and were ready to support the cause uh, with their labor and with their dollars. I thought this was fantastic. They were very inspiring. I went to one of their hearings. I heard about all of the storytelling they had dug up, and I said, I'm going to publish that. And that was where abolitionist voices came from. Excellent, beautiful. Uh, and what can participants of the Abolitionist Voices Workshop expect to learn? Uh, well, in AV, I'm going to say first, I'm not a historian. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a content expert. In fact, I hope to draw upon local historians and some of the students of this heritage to come in and educate us about this. Um, but I'm going to help participants learn more about publishing. That's my bailiwick. Um, what I brought for show and tell are some examples of the kind of publishing uh, that we might do. Uh, these are projects that have been done previously by our small press, Penn and Anvil. Um, let's say we have something short, a short article, a short reminiscence, a memoir, a story. It's not big enough to fill out a book, so we can publish a pamphlet or chapbook or tract. And in fact, abolitionist tracts were a very important part of that activism um, back during the Civil War era. So this is an example of one by a local Boston illustrator and writer. And you can see it's a thin little document. You don't have to shell out $10 for this kind of a thing. Instead, we'll print copies out in quantity, 20 and 30 and leave stacks in coffee shops and other public places. So that's one way of taking our stories and making them public, hence publication. Uh, we also do books. Uh, this is one that Penn and Anvil put out earlier uh, this year called Sufi Haiku. Uh, gentleman lives in Brookline. He's a scholar of Persian poetry and a boxer. Wow. Um, so this is about freedom, but not of the uh, uh, abolitionist variety. Instead, I call it spiritual freedom, Sufi haiku. So we have a local illustrator, a local writer, and we put it together in a format that's very suitable for the content. That's the kind of work that our workshop participants will learn to do. Uh, we also have standard, beautiful hardcover books. And if someone's interested in knowing how to put something like this together, from sourcing the art to designing the type, uh, editing the text, getting clearances, it sounds like a lot of work, but I hope to make it much simpler for our participants. No experience needed. Uh, finally, the one format that I'm really excited about is the poster or broadside. Um, this was a, a, a very important format in early American history, uh, one sheet of paper with words and images. Um, imagine the kind of storytelling we can do uh, with uh, original poems or historical texts. Incredible. So my next question was going to be what sort of community benefits do you anticipate uh, as a result of this workshop? But I believe you went over a good amount of those. If there's anything else you would like to add, though. Well, I, I would like to say that this is the kind of teaching uh, in, in publication and production that I did for many years in an environment that you could only access if you had a lot of advantage at the university level. Mm -hmm. We're taking that out of the campus. We're removing tuition. And through philanthropy, through the support of the Cultural Council at the town and state level, now that kind of teaching is available to community members free of charge. Beautiful, beautiful. Also, thank you. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, what steps has Bonfire Press taken to make sure that the workshop is accessible and inclusive to Fitchburg's radically diverse community? Uh, it's been a lot of conversations. Yes. Uh, I've been uh, going out and speaking to representatives and, and community organizations that I know have constituencies that don't necessarily overlap with the ones that always hear about these kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one funny anecdote. I went down to the mosque on Main Street, Bayt al Zikr, and I had been practicing my Duolingo Arabic. And I was so ready to knock on their door and have a conversation about what kind of books does your, do your community members want to buy at the bookshop? What kind of publishing would your community members be interested in? And they said, oh, no, no, we're Pakistani. We all speak Urdu. No one here speaks Arabic. So I, I didn't get too far with my linguistic study. But that's an example of the kind of outreach we've been doing. And that's great outreach. <laughs> like, I really have to say thank you. Um, we, don't, we don't hear a lot of stuff like that concerning outreach in the Fitchburg area. And it's uh, very important to have realistic examples, oh, so thank you. Oh, I'm glad to do it. Uh, I mean, what, what's there to complain about? I've met so many fantastic people. So many fantastic people. Getting so many recommendations about restaurants to go to, that's, that's really the boon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so we'll have to ask you about restaurants later. Um, now, what sort of challenges have you come across with this programming or with Bonfire Press or with the bookshop? Really anything? Um, honest truth, there, have been, there has been so much work done over the past several years by local activists, organizers, and municipal leaders to line up resources, to line up marketing channels and mailing lists, to have places where you can advertise programs and new businesses, to have grants available to help businesses open their doors and, and not just stay in survival mode but shift into thriving mode. So that's a lot of work I didn't have to do. I came here and people were ready to support an idea that seemed ready to support the community. So I am just counting my lucky stars. With regard to abolitionist voices, I think that my challenge has been and will continue to be intimidation. Mm -hmm. People are like, publishing, oh my gosh, that sounds like a big project. No, we're gonna meet on four Saturdays over the course of four months. We're gonna sit there for two hours and I'm gonna show you how to take your ideas and put them into some practical form. The, the lovely aspect about having so many different formats available is whatever your idea is, we have a way that it will fit and suit. And I, I think realizing that possibility is gonna be really empowering. Excellent. Um, let's see. So with the with the workshop specifically, uh, I see there are four dates, as you said. Uh, it is from 10 to noon and at the Idea Lab. Is it free? It's 100% free. 100% free. The only thing that we ask is that people do uh, register in advance. Uh, there's two reasons for that. I want to make sure that we don't get more people mm -hmm. uh, than we're ready for but also because this content can potentially be sensitive. Yes. We're talking about abolitionism, and that doesn't just mean um, the specific heritage of, frankly, white folks trying to uh, aid the situation of African Americans in slavery in the United States. Um, thanks, I think, largely to the advocacy of persons of color uh, over the past few decades, abolitionism has come to encompass a much broader range of striving for freedom, striving for diversity and justice. Uh, and I am not interested in having people who are not going to be respectful participate in this. I want this to be a safe space where people can talk about vulnerable content. So we are going to look at registration. Excellent. And when would the registration deadline be? Um, I, it will be open until the date of the workshop. All right. I've run a lot of programs uh, in Boston along these lines over the years, and so I have a sense of, of how many people we could expect given our population. Uh, I'm pretty confident that we'll get between 10 and 20 folks, uh, and that's really an ideal size. Excellent, excellent. So I see you have a few more things with you today aside from the publishing material that you've shown me. Would you be interested in talking about that? I, I don't mind bigging up Bonfire <laughs> Bookshop. Um, this is a mask. Uh, hopefully these kinds of things won't be needed very much longer in the near future. Um, but it's important for me to see, uh, show people that Bonfire Bookshop is a bricks and mortar thing. It's mm -hmm. not an online project or, or something abstract. We have 3,000 square foot. Uh, and that's expensive and ambitious, but I think it's important that people have a space outside of the home and outside of work where they can go and find their stories and share their stories. I will also show this amazing hoodie. This is the, our prototype product. So come on down to Bonfire Bookshop and you can get some apparel. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for meeting with us today. It was great to talk to you, Zach. I very much appreciate it. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for the chance to uh, hear me out a little bit. And thanks uh, once again to the Fitchburg Cultural Council for their support. Of course. All right. Thank you for watching FCC TV. Have a great night.